Welcome to Acton Line, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Gabriel Jaja, producer. In the early 1900s, the Netherlands was under the rule of a dynamic prime minister, Abraham Kuyper. A multifaceted figure, he implemented significant change in a vast array of sectors and contributed his work to Dutch society as a statesman, a journalist, a historian, a university founder, and a Calvinist theologian, among many other things. But what can contemporary economic and political reasoning gain from the work of a man who was not a conventional economist? In this episode, Dan Huger, librarian and research fellow here at the Acton Institute, is joined by Peter Heslam, senior member of Trinity College, University of Cambridge, to discuss Kuiper's teachings on business and economics. You can find additional resources in the show notes of this episode, as well as find previous episodes of Acton Line on our website at acton.org slash actonline. If you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Act in Line is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. Welcome. My name is Dan Huger, Librarian and Research Associate at the Acton Institute. Today I'm joined by Peter Heslam, Director of Transforming Business and a senior member of Trinity College, University of Cambridge. Previously, he was Director of the Entrepreneurial Leadership Initiative at the University of Oxford. He has published widely on business, economics, and religion, and is the author of Creating a Christian Worldview, Abraham Kuyper's Lectures on Calvinism. Most recently, he is editor of On Business and Economics, the latest volume of the 12-volume Abraham Kuyper Collected Works in Public Theology. This is a joint publication between Lexham Press and the Acton Institute. Today, we'll be discussing that volume and the perspective of the late statesman and theologian Abraham Kuyper on business and economics. Peter, welcome to Acton Line, and thank you for being with us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for the invitation. It's wonderful to have you. And just to sort of orient our listeners, who was Abraham Kuyper and what about him first drew you to the deep study you've done of his works? Yeah, good question. Well, do you know, I'd, I'd actually never heard of Kuyper and his name is not well known in the UK. But I did, as part of my undergraduate studies, Um, study Dutch studies along with Southeast Asian studies. Uh, And when you combine Dutch studies and Southeast Asian studies, the the emphasis then is uh, Indonesia, which used to be called the Dutch East Indies. And uh, in studying the history of the Dutch East Indies, I discovered that Kuiper had actually had a quite decisive influence on colonial policy. So my ears pricked up. And then uh, we, we followed lectures on the history of the Netherlands and Kuiper came up again as somebody who had brought emancipation to the orthodox reformed communities of the Netherlands who were pretty disenfranchised and helped them to establish schools and the free university, a political party, and to become thoroughly part of Dutch society, which was at the time kind of uh, dominated by the liberal mainstream. So there was Kuiper again as a, as a social reformer in the Netherlands that no historian of the 19th and 20th century can ignore. The, the, the first uh, prime minister of the Netherlands in the modern office of prime minister instigated change, not in one area of life, but in multiple areas of life, uh, in the church, in politics, in science and research, and in the arts. Uh, And so it goes on. So he not only stood for a Christian worldview that engages with every area of life, he had a career that spanned almost every area of life. I thought this is utterly exceptional. He actually does what he says. He he (laughs) practices what he preaches. This guy must be credible. Let's go off and study him. We had to go for a year to the Netherlands to study a topic of interest at what whichever Dutch university we were most interested in. So I looked up the Free University of Amsterdam, discovered that it still existed, 
and went there for my year abroad and did a year of research on Kuiper's colonial policy. And I, that was so fascinating to me that I later uh, went back and did a doctorate. Um, so, so it's it's been a few years of my life studying the the ideas of of Kuiper, which at the time I had to read all in Dutch, and and now thankfully a lot of his work is translated. So many more scholars across the world can read Kuiper than were reading it when I did my doctorate, and that's that's a great step forward. But this is an uh, is a towering figure in public life in the Netherlands, and he did so from an orthodox. Christian biblical perspective, and I think that makes him of interest to anyone interested in the cultural relevance of Christianity. He he's he's an amazing amazing sort of genius and, and dynamo for for activism. Um, he's all of these things. He's a theologian. He's a statesman. He's a journalist. To name but a few of those things, and he also founded that the Free University you mentioned, the political party, and and a denomination. Um, he was certainly entrepreneurial and enterprising in doing all of these things, but he's not a businessman in the conventional sense. Uh, he was also not an economist. Why should we look to Kuiper on questions of, of business and economics in particular, the, the subject of this volume? Yeah, that's a great question. Do you know, I've often joked with uh, Kuiper scholars that one day I'd like to sit down and write the missing stone lecture. And the Stone Lectures were lectures that Cowper gave at Princeton at the end of the 19th century. And he addresses Calvinism and politics, Calvinism and science, Calvinism and art, et cetera, et cetera. But is there a lecture on Calvinism and economics or Calvinism and business? No. And this uh, didn't strike me at the time, but it strikes me now that I've been looking at economics and business for the last few years, that this is a huge lacuna in Cowper's thought. And why, why is that the case? That Kuiper, as you say, he wasn't uh, from a business background, he wasn't from an economic background, but that generally didn't deter him from engaging. He wasn't yeah. an artist, but he did engage with the arts. Mm -hmm. So why not uh, with business and economics? Well, several reasons. One is uh, the Netherlands industrialized quite late compared to other European powers. So the business sphere, was not as developed uh, as it was in other places like the UK. And for that reason, Kuiper didn't see such a threat from the business sphere to civil liberties as he did from the political sphere where socialism and liberalism were on the rise. He, he saw the greatest threat to Christian engagement in society being a political threat he did not really see the business sphere as imposing a threat as such. And I believe if Cowper was alive today and asked to give a series of six lectures, he would definitely want to include one on the business sphere because it's the sphere that has risen, hasn't it? In huge, yes. huge power, you know, so that we have Jeff Bezos today making a trip into space and we have huge companies uh, uh, sometimes um, with greater capital flows than countries. And, and we're all very aware of the economic power that big companies and big banks can exercise. That just wasn't the case in Kuiper's day, but Kuiper being very prophetic, he saw it coming <laughs> and he does make warnings mm -hmm. about big business and global business and globalization and global capital markets. It's quite extraordinary. And I quote in the introduction to the volume some extracts that you would think that he was speaking about today's economy and the speculation that goes on. And it's very prophetic of the kind of 2009 kind of economic financial crash that we had and that's just Kuiper he's just so so prophetic so you're right there is a lacuna in Kuiper's thought and this volume is the first um, dedicated volume to Kuiper's thoughts on business and economics there's nothing else there and that's partly because Kuiper didn't uh uh, address it explicitly and consciously as I think he would today. So what we've had to do 
is go and look at what he did write about and pull out extracts of where he is talking about the business sphere because uh, he, he was the emancipator of the middle class, the lower middle classes in the Netherlands. What did most of the lower middle classes do? Well, they weren't lawyers, they weren't doctors, they weren't clergy. That For that, you have to go off and get a degree. And that was the problem. They were excluded from higher education. So they were the small traders. They were the shopkeepers, the farmers, all the kind of small entrepreneurs, brewing beer, gin, whatever they do selling tobacco, whatever they were selling, milk, you know, the cheese, you name it, yeah. Dutch are traders, and they have been traders for a very long time all over the world. That was the kind of demographic that Kuiper was uh, aimed at. They were often very orthodox Christians. So Kuiper was interested in them, and he knew that business was their lifeblood. So in that sense, he didn't have the typical academic bias against business he didn't didn't particularly see any reason why to be critical of it in the sense that yeah you just take it for granted this is how people live and you know um a century further on and there's a lot of cynicism uh, towards business in the academy but thankfully Kuiper doesn't suffer from it though he does uh exercise criticism where he sees dangers and, and Although he is known as the theologian of common grace, he's also the theologian of the antithesis, which is kind of like the other side of the coin of, of common grace, where you do allow God's negation of wrong practice and wrong behavior and sin uh, to be voiced. So you don't just bless everything that's going because of a doctrine of common grace. You affirm every sphere of human activity as being under the sovereignty of God. But because it's under the sovereignty of God, you need to challenge what's in antithesis to God's ways, God's ordinances that he's written into all of uh, creation. So, so there's a beautiful harmony in Kuiper's theology, which is often lost by followers who either want to claim Kuiper for the extreme right or the extreme left. And the annoying thing about Kuiper is he doesn't actually fit in either box. But I think for that reason, he's a fresh, dynamic theologian who could speak to people of all um, ideological persuasions. I'm sorry, that's a long answer to your question. No, <laughs> no, that's wonderful. And I, I love I love your drawing attention to the fact that um, this constituency, this this religious lower middle class, middle class constituency is one that he gives a political voice to. It's one that he helps develop institutions to serve. And in addressing the concerns of those people, he, he, he's engaged in this astonishing array of topics and he's using these powerful sets of analytical frameworks, the antithesis that you talked about, the role of divine providence, common grace, particular grace, um, all of the spheres of life. And, and so he ends up touching on business because these are the concerns of the people that he's concerned about. Um, we explored the question on why, why, why to listen to Kuiper on these issues of business and economics. But how does he actually approach these issues? Um, we alluded to this a little bit with the antithesis between between sort of the common grace and the antithesis. Um, how does he see that that role of business and economics um, in the lives of the people and in uh, in so, sort of society at large? Yeah. Well, uh, the way he um, comes at that question is with another doctrine. And that is often called sphere sovereignty. The idea that every uh, sphere of life has, because of God's ordinances that are written into it, a certain autonomy under God. They're not all answerable to the state. They're not all appendages of the state. They're free. And that's why he called the free university the free university and why he wanted an independent press 
and very happy for the Catholics also. You know, he, he was he was Orthodox Protestant, but very happy for others of other persuasions like Catholics also to have their free university and their newspaper if that's what they wanted to do. And in fact, that's often what happened, that the Catholic um, sphere in Dutch society got organised along similar lines, which have then been called pillari the pillarization of Dutch society, that you've got various pillars of life. Um, anyway, back to sphere sovereignty, that... that that then business is alongside other spheres such as science, the arts and the state, a, a noble calling and has ordinances written into it by God as to how that sphere should operate. And they, that should be then along the lines of integrity and value and virtue and this is why in the anthology, we pay a lot of attention to the Heidelberg Catechism. It's often when Kuiper is looking at the catechism, so the, the teachings that Dutch Reformed churches wanted to convey to their younger members, he found in those, uh, in that advice to, 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 let's say, confirmation candidates, I think we'd call them today, at least in the Anglican tradition, we'd say they're confirmation candidates and they're kind of learning about what the faith really means. And that's, this was a very strong thing in Dutch Reformed Protestantism, yeah. that, that, that he appealed to those documents, historic documents, um, to say, look, th what these theologians back when they were writing the catechism in the wake of the Reformation were concerned, was, were concerned about was everyday virtues, like not taking bribes and not cheating mm -hmm. and respecting property rights. Thou shalt not steal. There's a whole section in the book on, uh, on what the catechism says about that um, commandment. So the Ten Commandments as a whole, but especially uh, commandments to do with property, um, uh, you know, what does that actually mean in the business sphere? And, and so sphere sovereignty is a way that Cowper would say, look, not everything has to be answerable to the state. To compare it with extreme socialism, the state cannot run businesses. It's not competent to do so. It's not being given that task by God. It's not given that calling. Mm -hmm. the, the, the state, if you like, is more like an umpire ho holding the, the show on the road. It's, it's umpiring bet between the spheres. If the business sphere, for instance, starts to make um, strategies that are in conflict with the ways that families operate, for instance, it should be held to account because yes, it's yep. if it's making people work late into the evening or get up extremely early in the morning or work at weekends, for instance, it's infringing on the sovereignty of the sphere of the family. Or if, if you're working on a Sunday morning, it's infer interfering with the sovereignty of the church. So each sphere has to obey its own audiences and stay within its sphere. And if it doesn't, the state is right there, ready to step in and legislate. That's not the first port of call, but if it's necessary, the state should legislate. But it's not the state taking things over, it's legislation. That's what it's there to do. It, you know, he appeals to like teaching in Romans, for instance, about not holding the sword for nothing. You know, that magistrates do have a legitimate authority to step in and say, no, this is not allowed. You're trespassing on another sphere. Uh, similarly, the arts. So the, 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 the government can be a sponsor of the arts and be, or be enthusiastic about the arts and encourage the arts, be a sponsor in that way, but not, not tell artists what, <laughs> what to do. Yeah. Um, uh, and to allow the arts just as they allow science to 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 push the boundaries and discover things for themselves and that in science science is free and and any truth is god's truth don't be you know the state cannot step in as it had done so often in christian history 
to prevent scientists from coming up with ideas that were uh, were in collision on a collision course with doctrines of the church. There can't be any collision course because truth, whether you find it in the Bible or you find it through your microscope or telescope, is God's truth. And, and it hangs in harmony, even though it might look at sometimes that it doesn't. And it, it's challenging things that we thought were absolutely crystal clear and now we've got to revise things it's tr- if it's true it's true and if it's true it's god's truth this is a conservative ideas are no longer welcome on most college campuses or anywhere else for that matter if you are a conservative college student or professor then you already know what i am talking about if you are hungry for great conservative ideas look no further check out the conservative conversations with isi podcast today Presented by the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, this podcast is a series of in-depth conversations with leading thinkers of the most important issues facing conservatism. Join Johnny Burka and James Davenport and dig into the world of conservative ideas with thinkers like William F. Buckley Jr., Richard Weaver, Yuval Levin, Ross Douthat, and more. To listen, go to isi.org slash podcasts or subscribe on any of your favorite podcast platforms. Don't let them keep you from conservative ideas. Listen today. Interesting observation, because often we talk about the idea of limited government, and there's a sense in which in which that's there in Kuiper. But there's also a sense in which the function of the state itself is a limiting state, as it seeks to limit the trespasses of one sphere upon another. Um, that's that's an amazing observation. Yeah, so it's not a minimal state. So he's not a neoliberal in the extreme sense of that, that, you know, get, just get the state out of the way and everything will be fine. Yeah. But you're right. He is a, he, he is a limited state, so not minimal, but limited. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it should have the power to step in, but it's, 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 it's as restricted power yeah absolutely yeah and we talked about how a lot a lot of a lot of this thought comes out of his engagement with the heidelberg catechism and christian doctrine Mm. there's a there's a way that this volume sort of progresses organically um that's very interesting in which we we go from that and then the next section of the anthology takes a sort of broader and more sociological approach to sort of the conditions of labor in the working class what are what's Kuiper's perspective on the struggles of the working class at his time and the church's sort of obligation of solidarity to the working class? Yeah, that's a, also a great question. And and here I think Kuiper can uh, appear to those who who want to adopt him from the left as 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 a champion for their cause. And 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 it's right that Kuiper does come out against the abuse of workers. And he does see, even though Holland, as I said, didn't have the, the big industries of other countries, he saw it happening. He was he was very eclectic in his reading and he traveled a lot. So he was very aware of the huge industrialization of places like the UK and the um, oppression of the working classes. So he does in those um, pieces that you just mentioned, the sociological pieces, come out fighting for the rights of workers and was very supportive of workers getting into unions and, he, he, and even uh, with, the, w- w- with other colleagues helped to found, a Christ, as he would, because he's founded a Christian university and a Christian newspaper and a Christian part, political party, he goes the full hog mm-hmm. and helps with the founding of a Christian union for workers. And the Catholics then do something similar. And now I've just mentioned Catholics. Cowper was actually, on social issues, an admirer of the way the Catholics had addressed social issues, for instance, in Rerum Novarum, one of the most influential uh, encyclicals and kind of founded Catholic uh, social teaching in many ways, yeah. he, he was an admirer of that and actually said to Protestants, Protestants, you're behind the Catholics in your social thinking, because look at them. Yeah. They've got this amazing encyclical and it comes up for the rights of the poor. So, yes, he was uh, willing for workers to organise to make demands, 
and uh, even uh, protected their right to go on strike. That, in the end, becomes problematic when he's prime minister and he has a strike and oh, the country <laughs> sees, <laughs> yeah. and the country seizes up and he's got to do something to get it going again. But maybe we don't need to go there. But 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 that uh, well, let's just nail it now. I think yeah. um, you know. What is lovely about Cowper is that he does get the chance to be prime minister. So you don't just have a theologian doing economics and doing politics. You have a guy who actually has a go at being in the in the in the in the chair, so to speak. Uh, and that I think just uh, shows us when we look at Cowper that things in practice are always more complicated than they are when you're giving a speech or writing a reflection or a newspaper article. And that's fine. They are more difficult. Um, so we get with Kuiper the rough and the smooth. We get the guy who's struggling um, with the practice of politics to push forward um, his more idealistic ideas. And anyway, he's in a coalition. He can't govern. No, you know, Dutch government doesn't run on winner takes all. Dutch government wins on. Uh, small parties being able to make coalitions with other small parties enough to make the majority to form a government still happens today mm -hmm. with a system of proportional representation so you he was he was in a coalition government when he was prime minister and of course didn't always get his way and found things difficult and was of course ridiculed by the press in part because he started his career as a clergyman so, you know, you can imagine the press have got it out for him. What does this clergyman think he's doing in the, yeah. <laughs> the most important political role in the country? So, so yes, in his um, ideas about the working classes, he is very progressive. Kuiper is ahead of his time and, and yet he's not a socialist and mm -hmm. he's willing to be absolutely public about that. He is... He's got it in for socialists and makes that absolutely clear. But does that make him then, you know, uh, an extreme right winger? Absolutely not. He was he was willing to come up for the rights of the working class for unionisation and, and all the rest. So, again, I think we've got a nuanced figure who's trying to steer a middle course between the conservatives on the one hand and the utter radical um, socialists on the other. Yeah, some of those uh, depictions in the press, there are there are political cartoons that are yeah. uh, an astonishing array. Many of them, many of them by, um, and I'm forgetting the name of the individual, but he was a, a man involved in socialist party politics and a famous yeah. uh, cartoonist. Um, we'll we'll include a link to some of those in the show notes because <laughs> he yeah he does not. Get a fair and, and, it's, and it's partly Kuiper, Kuiper was sometimes sensitive, but it's partly his greatness that he thought those cartoons were so well done that he approved of a kind of a collection of those cartoons, which put him in a really yeah. bad light. But he thought they were, you know, cleverly done. Um, so, you know, I think that's a sign of, of his greatness that he he was willing to to show respect for that cartoonist. Absolutely. Now. You had mentioned earlier uh, Leo the Thirteenth's encyclical Rerum Novarum, um, yeah. which which came out in, in 1891, yeah. which which brings us which brings us to sort of the center of this anthology, which is Kuiper's opening address to the Christian Social Congress, also in 1891 on uh, the social question in the Christian religion. Yeah. Um, this is this is a fascinating document that offers. A real foundation for for sort of modern Christian social thought in the in the in, in the Protestant world, and in a similar way that Rerum Novarum did, and inaugurate modern Catholic social teaching. Um, what are what's the place of business and economics within a Christian society in this in this sort of broad, comprehensive vision that Kuiper tries to lay out for uh, for the social question in the Christian religion? Yeah, he he is, um, I think, very aware that um, the, the business sphere has legitimacy. It um, expresses the creativity and abundance of God. Um, he is a thinker who, who thinks a lot about creation. And I've often reflected on this because a, a lot of 
you could say evangelical or reformed um, thinkers kind of get to the the two central acts of the Christian story. You could say if the Christian story could be summarized in four acts, mm -hmm. creation, fall, redemption and restoration. And, and a, a classic kind of gospel centered theology stresses the fall. So it stresses the problem we're in. Mm -hmm. We're sinful. We fall short. Ah, but here's the solution. Redemption. But Cowper goes back to creation uh, and makes it a four part play, not a two part play. And 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 so what I think he's doing in that speech is recognizing that human beings are infinitely valuable and have infinite dignity because they are made in the image of God. And because they're made in the image of God, they, they, they are capable of goodness. They're also capable of sin because the second part of the play is the fall. Yeah. But we know about that. that. But that doesn't happen until Genesis 3. You've got Genesis 1 or 2 yeah. <laughs> to get there first. And he paid a lot of attention to that. So, so I think what he's doing is he, he is in that speech really exercised about the fallenness of uh, the business sphere. Mm. No, no doubt about it. But he's not going to give in to this narrative that just stresses the fall and redemption and just stresses the wickedness of the economic sphere. That can't be God's way. If God has created all things and pronounced it good, uh, there's got to be more to society than this damning critique on, from the left. And, and, and then we, we have creation and then we have redemption. So he has a redemptive view, as he would as a reformational thinker, a redemptive view of what business can actually do. So the scandal of what he's attacking in that speech is because actually business could be a liberating force mm -hmm. and it's serving to oppress people. And then consummation, he spends a lot of time writing about the restoration. So the, the fourth act of the play is uh, restoration, isn't it? Consummation, mm -hmm. call it what you will, the, the end times, the, the eternal state of bliss. And when everything is, is kind of returns to the way it was intended uh, when God created uh, everything. And we go back to that freedom that there is in the Garden of Eden and everything is, is shalom and in harmony. And he made a lot of that, particularly at the end of his life. He wrote a lot about um, that fourth act of the of the play. I'm calling it, he, he doesn't call it a play. I'm calling it a play. But it's a way of, yes, kind of, yeah. of, of understanding his worldview. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so again, in that speech, he's, he, he is visionary mm -hmm. and he's lifting people's horizons to a better future without becoming utopian because of the fall yeah and yet you know this is this is all under god's control so, so there's hope and things can improve and it's not uh, that the 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 oppressors have always got the upper hand over the oppressed um which is actually something that comes out a lot in liberation theology so i think if he was around yeah. when the liberation theologians were at their peak he would have been he would have been very critical of their kind of black and white worldview mm -hmm. so, so i i think that speech is wonderfully advanced in its theological approach to the problem of widespread poverty in a rapidly industrializing europe there is an interest, whenever you look back in the past and whenever you approach these sort of things in these, in the discussion of these issues, it's oftentimes disorienting because the, the issues aren't necessarily our issues. Um, there aren't the sort of problem, there are certain perennial problems, there are certain particular problems that are historically contingent. But one of the great things that Kuiper models is going back and trying to situate in, in, in his time how to view this through a biblical and theological lens, which is something he models that, that, we can, that we can do in the present. 
and it's it's really the, I think uh, one of the one of the lasting legacies is is that is that return to biblical narrative is a way of coming to a better understanding and appreciation of the society we're in, in both its successes and its failures, and uh, in potential remedies going forward. Peter, thank you so much for being with us today. This has been this has been illuminating. The volume is wonderful. It addresses so many questions uh, on business and economics, but through so many of those lenses that Kuiper brings to bear on all other questions as well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, he, 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 uh, we need to go, but he was, he was an inspirational figure and he painted with a kind of a broad brush. You've got to see him like an impressionist painter. So he, he can paint these wonderful theological frameworks. And it's, of course, then the job of us to apply them to the context of today. And that's complex. But in Cowper, we can find the vision. We can find the frameworks. We can find the handles, the ways in, the kind of a public theology framework that we need to address the detail of today. So I think that's what he can offer us in the main for today. Absolutely. Thank you so much again. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can email our team at actonline at actin.org. Until next week, for Actonline, I'm Gabriel Zsazsa.